Last week, you, uh, you saw me, or I believe I, I quoted something that now is on the slide or will be on the slide here shortly, a quote from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University and their American Worldview Inventory, which was done last year in 2020. I want to read a slightly lengthy quote that I read, I read a portion of last week because this is part of why we are doing this gospel-centered series. So the quote reads, Now research, research shows that unlike past generations who readily recognize the reality of sin and the need for salvation through Jesus Christ, American adults today increasingly adopt a salvation-can-be-earned perspective with a plurality of adults, 48%, believing that if a person is generally good or does enough good things during their life, they will, quote, earn, end quote, a place in heaven. Only one-third of adults, 35%, disagree with that statement, according to the findings that I mentioned from the CRC at the Arizona Christian University. Next paragraph. But most surprisingly in the latest findings from the American Worldview Inventory 2020 is that a majority of people who describe themselves as Christian, 52%, accept a works-oriented means to God's acceptance. More shockingly, huge proportions of people associated with churches whose official, official doctrine says, well, eternal salvation comes only from embracing Jesus Christ as Savior, believe that a person can qualify for heaven by being or doing good. That includes half of all the adults associated with Pentecostal churches, mainline Protestants, and evangelical churches, and a larger share of Catholics embrace that point of view. So there's a lot of confusion on what it means to be a Christian and what the message of Christianity is. And that's why last week I tried to unpack the heart of Christianity, which is the gospel, the good news. This week I want us to delve into preserving that priceless gospel. And that is the title for today's sermon, Preserving the Priceless Gospel. When I think of something priceless, I think of the engagement diamond that I bought for my wife. Now, it's not the biggest diamond in this room, I'm sure. I had a limited budget. But I remember going downtown uh, Chicago, 5 South Wabash, to Jewelers Row. I think you've heard me mention this perhaps before. Uh, a building of, I don't know, 20, 30 stories worth of jewelers. Most Jewish by faith and a highly covenanted group of individuals where your word was your bond. You bought a diamond from another diamond dealer, you agreed on it, you shook, that was it. And you broke that, you broke your word, you were done, you were out of the building. I remember looking at the GIA papers for my wife's diamond, which is the, uh, the organization that, that, that credits diamonds, that makes sure that it, one, it's a real diamond, and two, it has four C's or ways of describing the diamond and, and grading the diamond, clarity and other factors that are there. Friends, our gospel is like a precious diamond. Today we're going to unpack what I mean by that and what the gospel doesn't mean. And ultimately, I want us to appreciate in a fresh way for many of us, and perhaps in a new way, today, why the gospel is the most precious thing on earth. Would you please stand with me and open up to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, this is page 671 in your paper pew Bible. Galatians chapter 1, we're going to read the first 10 verses of Paul's opening uh, thoughts and prayers for the church in Galatia. I'll start reading at verse 1 here. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Verse 7. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. 
And as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Finally, verse 10. For I am now, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we hear these words and I've tried to capture the, the, the terseness of them, the, 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 the anger, the righteous anger that Paul has. Not because he's perfect, not because he is anything more than just a servant of the gospel, but that is because why he's so upset. He realizes that this young church is already forsaking the good news that they just heard and believed. And Father, we know that your spirit is the one who writes through the authors of scripture. So this reflects your heart towards us, towards the temptation every one of us has faced to turn from the gospel, from the good news of grace alone and by faith alone in Christ alone to something that adds on or takes away from that. Oh spirit, we pray through your word and through your messenger that is me today Speak truth into our lives and let us not go from this place unchanged. We pray all these things for your glory. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> it was the preacher of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who famously said, there is nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes 1.9. And he's still right today, isn't he? What we struggle with today theologically is really not that different from what people struggled with in history. And as we just read all the way back in the town of Galatia in the Roman Empire. To prove my point, I want to quote a third century pastor and theologian named Tertullian. He's most famous for his quotes on martyrdom. He's the one who said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. He also had some very interesting thoughts on culture. But I want to share a kind of an obscure quote. Frankly, it may not even be from Tertullian himself. It may be from one of his followers. But nonetheless, I think it packs a punch. Just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, so the gospel is ever crucified between these two heirs. So just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, so the gospel is ever crucified between these two heirs. Well, what are these two heirs that Tertullian speaks of? They are the heirs of moralism, we sometimes call legalism, or even just religion. And the other is relativism, sometimes called licentiousness, that's a fancy big word, or irreligion. It seems no matter how hard we try, our sinful natures, that part of us which is still not yet perfect in obedience to Christ, wants to fall into one or the other. And I think if you were honest and if I was honest and we went back through our lives, we could point to places where we were either leaning on that legalistic side or that, well, whatever, don't worry about it. There's, there's, grace will cover that. And so we want, as Paul wants and as the Lord wants, for the gospel to be that sharp, centered sword. So let's dig in then to the first of these two errors, these two thieves that steal away from the joy of the gospel and entrap us. Let's talk about moralism or legalism or religion. What atheists sometimes call, yes, religion with some sarcasm. It's the idea that somehow, some way, we have earned our salvation. Again, somehow, some way, I get some credit. It's the idea in Paul's time that you needed to be a good Jew before becoming a Christian. Again, you needed to be a good Jew to then believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is upset about and what we just read in Galatians chapter one. Let's turn back there to verses six through nine. He says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. The Galatians are deserting that gospel, that true gospel and are now going back because of some Judaizers is the term used, some Jewish men or women who are claiming to be Christian, but they're, they're talking to these Gentile Jews and these other Jewish 
Christians, these, I'm sorry, Gentile Christians and Jewish, and they're saying, you, you got to do, you got to uphold the law and then believe in the gospel. You've got to earn it. You've got to work for it. They've turned to a false gospel. And unlike Paul's letters, friends, if we were to read through Ephesians, Philippians, or Colossians, Paul doesn't give them a fluffy, loving pastoral greeting. He kind of comes out, he comes out swinging. I am astonished, he says. So Solomon's right. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. We as well struggle with legalism, don't we? So what, what is legalism? Some of you are saying, well, pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, this next slide, I think, just says it well. Jesus plus anything. Jesus plus anything equals a false gospel. Jesus plus anything is some sort of legalism. It says Jesus isn't enough. We've got to do more or be more. Jesus isn't enough. Jesus plus the Jewish law is a false gospel. Jesus plus another book like the Book of Mormon is a false gospel. Jesus plus, and you insert, is a false gospel and therefore reduces or removes salvation. Jesus plus, friends, is not the good news of the gospel. And think about it. It's not a good message anymore, is it? I mean, we talked last week, gospel means good news. It's a message of salvation. It's the best news you've ever heard. You were condemned and, I, and now I'm telling you Jesus has bought your forgiveness. Oh, but this. You see, it's no longer really good news. It's kind of like that friend or family member who gives you a gift with strings attached. You ever had that? And you learn after a while, I don't even want the gift anymore. <laughs> no, thank you. The strings attached aren't worth whatever it you're trying to accomplish with this gift. So Jesus plus something is a type of moralism, a type of legalism, a type of earning our salvation. And there are so many variations. We could be here all day. Paul, in Romans chapter 5, has a reminder for us that I think is helpful, especially if, like me, you struggle with legalism. You want to be able to earn something. You want to pay back Jesus. You're, you're in debt, and you want to pay him back. Let's turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. For while we were still weak, Paul writes, at the, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. What a great reminder of the truth of the heart of the Gospels. You and I were never clean enough for Jesus to die for us, and if that was our perspective, if that was our hope, but rather he died for us while we were still sinners. It's not as if one day I woke up and thought, I, I want to follow Christ. No, he had to pursue me. He had to pursue you. And he pursued you while you were still a sinner, just like every other human on this earth. Friends, the gospel can never be bound up with our works. The works are the result of the gospel, not what earns us the good news. The results, and we cannot get those confused. And did you notice some of the timestamps in Romans chapter 5? While we were still weak, at the right time Christ died, while we were enemies. There's no doubt in Paul's mind that Christ died before, not after. There's no doubt that he died for the ungodly. God shows his love for us, friends, that while we were still sinners, Christ 
died for us. And this illustration from a sermon from Matt Chandler came back to my mind, and I'm going to try not to cry because it's one of those. Matt's a young believer. I think he's in college, and he brings a sister with him. I think they were in classes together. Uh, She's a single mom. She's in a hard way. Things are not going well for her, and he has just believed in the good news of Jesus. He has experienced the joy of knowing his sins are forgiven. So he brings her to a revival, or he thought it was a revival. And the preacher comes up, and he has a a perfect rose. And for sake of argument, we'll say a white rose, a perfect rose. And he takes that rose, and he passes it down to the first uh, people in the pew. And there's hundreds of college students here. And he says, go ahead, pass it around. Everybody touch that rose, and then when you're done, you know, bring it back to me. Well, this was his clear intention. So as while this rose is going around the room, he begins a talk on purity, Perhaps he thought this is a good top topic for college kids. They're getting into bad things, shouldn't be fooling around sexually before marriage, all that. But he had a clear plan for this rose, and maybe you've already seen it coming, especially with a talk on purity. What do you think happened to that rose after 300 college students touched it? By the time that rose came back to him, it was mangled. It was filthy. It was broken. And he turned to the young men and women in this audience, in this church, I think it was, and says, why would anybody want a rose like this? Who would want a dirty rose like this? And Matt said it took all his strength not to scream, Jesus would. Jesus would want that rose. Jesus would want that broken man or woman full of their sexual sin, their addiction to pornography, the prostitute, the son or daughter who was molested and has never felt clean. Jesus died for that rose, for you, for me. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now on the other side of moralism or legalism, or religion in a cynical sense is irreligion or licentiousness or whateverism. <laughs> okay? This is the viewpoint that says, hey, we're saved from hell. We don't need to worry all that much about living a life of holiness. I mean, on the one hand, it's a viewpoint that in times I've seen it really emphasizes grace. But on the other hand, it reduces God's holiness. His holiness and his Law becomes subjective up to the interpreter, not God, who is the creator of heaven and earth and the one who is only true and holy, but uh, the the holder of it, right? To be fair, some of us have struggled with this very personally, maybe even recently. I mean, we, we find ourselves reacting sometimes to an overly legalistic home that we grew up in or maybe what we felt like was the church culture. We felt like the do's and don'ts were just silly at points. So we react and we go the other way. We try out what our friends told us isn't that big of a deal and some of it's true and some of it really leads us into some bad stuff and we get into a lot of trouble and we know it. One of the dangers of a low view of holiness or a, if you will, a a selective or relative moralism is that we start to not really care about the spiritual fruit that Paul and the scriptures talk about as being a result of being saved. And so in Galatians 5, a little bit later in that letter, Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We sometimes forget that those are supposed to be marks of the Christian. This is the fruit of what God's Spirit is doing in our lives when he plucked us from our sin and the wrath that we were under. We forget this when we move on that path towards relativism. And perhaps even more concerning is when we start viewing our Christian faith just as a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's a way of viewing our faith as, as seen in people you might say, you hear them say, you know, I was baptized, yeah. I'm a Christian. All the while, they're doing all this stuff that you know is wrong, and it's evil. And the scriptures say, don't do that. But they're doing it. They're justifying it. They've somehow relativized God's holiness. 
Chapter 3, Paul talks about uh, Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. And then he talks about freedom in Christ. And in chapter 5, where we'll turn now just a little bit before what we just read of the fruit of the Spirit, Paul writes, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we'll pause there. I'm a college student, I'm 18 years old at this point, and I'm sitting down with Doug Hurley, the college pastor at a small Christian church. And I'm a Catholic kid, so I have not really read the scriptures much at all. And he wants me to understand the holiness of God and the seriousness of sin. And so we read this passage in Subway, because how do you get a college kid to come hear the gospel? You buy him food. So I was there for that Subway sandwich, I don't know what it was. But if it was today, it would be a spicy Italian with all the fixing and the hot peppers, just in case you're wondering. But in all seriousness, I remember that passage and I remember the weight of conviction because I could check off a bunch. I could check off a bunch just from that last semester. And I remember that weight. And then at some point, he moved to the good news. Yeah, Kevin, but you know what? Jesus died for you while you were still doing those things. You don't have to get cleaned up to be good enough for Jesus to accept you. No, 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 no. It's grace. It's a gift. Now, I resisted it, and and maybe some of you had that same story. I resisted it. Maybe it was my pride. Maybe it was that I liked my sin more than I liked Jesus at the time. And I ran even more into sin. And I remember oh, some of this stuff. And I was really depressed. I can recall just being sad at some of my decisions. And I think looking back, that was, that was the Spirit's work on my heart. And I called up Doug. It had been a while. And we got together. And I don't think it was more than a week later that I was being baptized. And someday I'm going to try to find again this picture I have of me with a huge sombrero on my head because the tradition at the church at that time was you got baptized, then you went out to Chi-Chi's for some Mexican food. (laughs) So I've got this huge sombrero on my head. I've got hair down to my shoulders, by the way. It wasn't back in a ponytail at that point. And uh, I got a free lunch out of it. Sweet. I guess the theme is food. Yeah, John noticed that. Thanks, John. (laughs) So now you see, though, there are two thieves, and they're always trying to steal one side to the other. Earn, earn your salvation. Or don't take, don't really take your salvation seriously. Don't take the holiness of God. The words and the scriptures where we say that we are slaves or servants of Christ. Friends, we want to stay in that center. We want to stay like a good hunter. We want our scopes right on that bullseye. It reminds me, lastly, of a famous quote by John Owens, a a theologian from uh, the 1600s who in summarizing Romans chapter 8, 13, said this, be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. Again, his summary of Romans 8, 13, and then he wrote like a 500-page book on it because that's how Puritans are. All right, Romans chapter 1, turn there with me. Romans chapter 1. So the heart of Christianity, friends, is the gospel. We're always going to be tempted, and I mean that sincerely. If you don't believe that, look at your life at points, and you'll see times when you were tempted, one side or the other. Sometimes it's the reaction, oh, I was getting legalistic, so, oh, I got drunk that one night, whatever. So we're we're always being pushed and pulled because we're just still not fully holy, and we need to depend on Jesus. That's the point, right? Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile, that's us. For in it, in that gospel, is the the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what's Paul saying? One, obviously he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed as a Christian to say, I'm, I'm saved by grace. 
God forgives me of my sins because of what he did, not because of what I did. All I brought to the table was my sin. Paul is not ashamed. Two, notice the Old Testament quote. Friends, we have to stop believing the lie that the Old Testament is legalistic. It's not. The law is a means of grace. God gave our Old Testament forefathers the the law so they could commune with him. It was a gift. Now, granted, you're right, in the New Testament, we're constantly seeing Paul or Jesus rebuke the Pharisees who are becoming legalists. But it was always grace. It was always grace. It was grace that God saved Noah and his family. He didn't have to. They didn't earn it. It was grace. So we have to stop believing that false dichotomy that the New Testament is grace and the Old is not baloney. I will argue with you until I can argue no more from the scriptures that that is not true. But it does point out how easy it is for us to make the law into a way to earn the gospel. And I come to my last illustration, Martin Luther. It's the 16th century. Martin Luther is a very good Roman Catholic priest. He's an Augustinian monk. He's also a professor. He's teaching New Testament. And he reads that verse 17, which please keep that up on the, on the go back one. Keep that up there. He reads verse 17 and something changes. Now we have to know a little bit about what it was like to read the Bible back in that day. In church, in Catholic church, which was the only church there was, um, the Bible was read in Latin, okay? Jerome's uh, translation of the Bible in Latin. Why was it in Latin? Well, because during the early Roman Catholic church, that's what you spoke in Rome. You spoke Latin in addition to other languages, but Latin was that language. So Jerome's Bible translation of the Old and New Testament into Latin is what you read. And that verse 17, and I give credit here to R.C. Sproul for his talk on this topic. So I'm borrowing from the late R.C. Sproul, who is loving being in the presence of Jesus even as we speak. When Luther would read in the Latin, for in it the righteousness of God, that word in Latin, justicare, is a combination of Um, just, and the verb to make. So, in essence, it was a legal Roman term that said you are made just, or you are made right, okay? So that was what was read, and that represents the Roman Catholic faith. It is a works-based or righteousness-based faith at a very basic level. The idea is, is that you take your sacrament, starting with baptism, to make you right, they, they make you right before God. Or if you don't do them, you, you, risk, you risk a long time in purgatory. This idea that is not in the scriptures, but was very prevalent at Martin Luther's time, that there's an in-between state between heaven and hell where you can burn off your sins and kind of pay for your lack of justification based on your works. And we could talk more about that, but I'll keep moving on here. So the aha moment is Luther's finally reading the Bible in the original Greek. And he notices that the word is dikaiosune. It doesn't mean to make just or to make righteous, but to be declared righteous. Not to be made, but to be declared righteous. Now some of you are going, okay, pastor, I don't get it. Here's where the rubber meets the road. The good news of the gospel isn't that you can make yourself righteous by your works, but that Jesus' sacrifice makes you righteous. It's an alien righteousness. It has nothing to do with what you did or didn't do. By faith, you receive Christ's righteous account. Your ledger My college ledger of all of my sins and transgressions was huge. But when Jesus, when I believed in Jesus by faith, God no longer sees that. He sees Christ's ledger and he is perfect and he is holy and it's been given to me and to you. Now for a Roman Catholic priest every day trying to earn his salvation, as a young Catholic kid, thinking literally numerous times after Mass, 
Don't fight about who goes in the front seat. Don't call shotgun on the way to the car. Bam, did it, we're yelling, we're arguing. And I felt, I blew it again, and I blew it again. But Luther gets it. The gospel shines in a way that changes the world. Friends, it is not that we have to earn it. It is a gift. It is given. And Luther said in so many words, he he walked out feeling the joy of the Holy Spirit for the first time in his life. And it was as if the gates of heaven had opened up and the burdens that he had carried for so long were sloughed off. How about you? How heavy is the burden that you bear? Are you living to justify yourself before God over and over again? Checking off your lists, comparing yourself with others? Or have you taken what Christ has done for granted? Do you take so lightly that he shed his blood? The holy, perfect God came down to live in our filth. Do you and I take that for granted? Do we spit on it by the way that we treat the gospel in our lives? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace, friend, insert your name, for by grace, Kevin, you have been saved through faith. By grace, Brian, you have been saved by faith. By grace, Doug, Diane, Julia, Sarah. By grace, by God's goodness, you have been saved through faith. And that is our part of the puzzle, is to believe or to receive that gift. And this is not of our own doing, right? We don't go back to fooling ourselves, thinking, well, I got it and you didn't. That's not the point. And it is not a result of works so that no one may boast. Friends, we have the privilege of preserving the precious gospel. It is like that diamond I described to you. So today we're working on that clarity, seeing it for what it is, not not going towards working it out on my own, not towards licentiousness, living as if God didn't die on a cross to save you from your sins. We want to preserve that clarity of the diamond. The next few weeks, we're going to look at the complexity of the gospel and how being in Christ changes all of our lives. How being a Christian, being in Christ, our identity is now Christ, changes everything. And we're going to unpack what that means in the next weeks to come. I hope you'll stay with us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your good news, for your gospel. We thank you that we have no need to earn our salvation. We cannot make things right. We will never be good enough. We will never be holy enough. But Jesus, you love us, the broken, dirty, trampled on, used roses that we are. And you've swapped, you've given us a perfect, a perfect ledger. It's a transaction. It's done in the past. It is done, signed, sealed, collected. Thank you for the gift. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. May we believe more each day this week and in the weeks and months to come of the goodness of your gospel. For only you are worthy of all our praise. In your name we pray. Amen.